With the upcoming arrival of new anime this spring, we will now delve deep in one of the anticipated releases, Kaiju No. 8. The narrative centers on Kafka Hibino, a man who, upon consuming a kaiju, acquires the power to transform into one himself. Now, he must learn to harness this ability as he strives to join an organization dedicated to eradicating kaiju. This quest is driven by a vow he made with a childhood friend, adding a deeply personal stake to his journey. Let's get started. Japan, the land of kaiju. This nation boasts the highest monster emergence rates in the world. As this was being explained, a kaiju suddenly appeared, promptly reported by camera drones to have emerged in Kanagawa Prefecture, within the city of Yokohama. The drones immediately initiated the evacuation of residents from the city. Suddenly, the kaiju's eyes bled, and as it was reported that the kaiju's fortitude level was at level 6 with no threat of an emergence-induced tsunami, the kaiju collapsed with a large wound on its body. A woman holding a gun was shown, and the camera drones reported that the kaiju had been neutralized. A man, watching from a distance through his binoculars, commented on the mess at the scene. It was revealed that this man was part of a cleanup crew called Monster Sweeper Incorporated, responsible for clearing the aftermath of the kaiju battle. Soon, the group decided to head to the site they were assigned to clean. In the following scene, the woman who defeated the kaiju was shown again, accompanied by two men. It was explained that they were members of the 3rd Division, and they were given a standing ovation by the people for defeating the kaiju. While the news about the recent kaiju and information about Yoju, the residual kaiju, played, Monster Sweeper Incorporated began their cleaning operation. We were introduced to Kafka Hibino, a 32-year-old man, requesting a heat chainsaw because the kaiju bone he was cutting was too hard. He noticed his co-worker lifting a part of the kaiju and warned him not to do so. However, before he could finish explaining that overstimulation would cause it to explode, it indeed exploded. It was explained that after the battle against the kaiju, a second, lesser-known battle begins. Kafka's co-worker was splashed with a toxic substance after the explosion, prompting an immediate call for a stretcher. Without any standing ovations or thanks, they fought an unsung battle against the kaiju. Kafka commented that the scenes left by the 3rd Division always made it difficult to distinguish between organs and non-organs. He also found it hard to believe they were expected to clean up the massive mess left by the kaiju in the 3rd Division by the end of the week. An officer called him and informed him that his post was changing. When he asked where he was being transferred, he was told it would be to the intestines, which shocked and scared him. His co-worker offered condolences as the officer pulled him away, explaining that they had already spoken to the higher-ups. Another co-worker asked Kafka if intestine duty was really that bad, to which another explained that he should just think about what he would see there to get the answer to his question. In short, being assigned to intestine duty ensured you would lose your appetite. Kafka was shown grimacing while working on the kaiju's intestinal part. After work, Kafka immediately lay down on his bed due to exhaustion as soon as he got home, commenting that he could still smell the foul odor of the kaiju intestine. Upon turning on his TV, he watched a feature about the 3rd Division of the Defense Force, praising them for neutralizing a kaiju. The person responsible for assembling these troops was none other than Mina Ashiro, a 27-year-old who had killed numerous kaiju. The reporter explained without a doubt that she was one of the most popular captains currently in service due to her skills and beauty, and was even regarded as a shoe-in for future corps commander. While watching, a flashback showed a young girl who appeared to be Mina Ashiro, declaring that they would eradicate all kaiju together. This made Kafka ponder how he ended up on the other side of things. Soon, he caught himself thinking and quickly reprimanded himself. He rationalized that the cleanup was also an important public service, and he was able to live in a nice apartment and eat what he wanted because of his job. That should be enough. In the next scene, Kafka arrived at his workplace, the professional kaiju cleaning company, Monster Sweeper Incorporated, the following day. He was irritated because he still had a hangover, 
blaming the special TV feature for his excessive drinking. Upon entering their office, Kafka was introduced to their new part-timer, Rino Ichikawa, an 18-year-old male who wished to join the defense force. Then, Kafka's co-worker, Toku, mentioned that Kafka had also once attempted to join the defense force. However, he had decided to leave and chose to become a steadfast presence in their current job. While this was being explained, Kafka, out of embarrassment, wished his co-worker would just shoot him. When Kafka was about to speak, Reno suddenly asked why he gave up, catching him off guard. Because of this, Kafka replied that he had given his all, but let's just say the competition was tough, and everyone has their limits, sadly, he reached his. When Kafka said that Reno would understand when he got older, Reno bluntly responded that he would never understand because he is not the type of person to give up easily, so as long as he lives, he will never comprehend it. Nor did he want to understand it. Reno then entered the locker room, leaving Toku bewildered, having thought the two would get along. Kafka was near tears, thinking it was unfair because whatever he said made him seem pathetic. He then questioned himself if giving up was really that bad. In the next scene, the sweepers prepared for their next job. Let's refer to them as sweepers since their company is called Monster Sweeper Incorporated. Their officer explained that Toku and his team would team up with the Ida cleaners to cut off the Kaija's arms. He added that, as per the contract, the least damaged muscle fibers would be turned over to Takatsuki development. Mitsuike's team would continue with the skeletal cleanup, and all intact bones they found would go to Izumo Tech, while Yoshimura's team would cut off the legs and dispose of them. Their officer instructed Reno to join him in the intestines, which delighted Kafka, but his happiness was short-lived when he was told he would also be part of that task. Kafka cried out in frustration, questioning why he was assigned to the intestines for two consecutive days. So the officer explained it was because he was skilled at cleaning intestines. Soon after, Kafka grabbed the hose and tearfully got on with the job, earning the officer's praise for ultimately doing the work. The officer thought that if Kafka could just find his footing, he would surely make an excellent division officer. In the next scene, during their lunch break, Kafka smirked because Reno was feeling disgusted by their work in the intestines, a sentiment Kafka also shared. Noticing Reno hadn't opened his lunchbox, Kafka asked if he wasn't going to eat it, to which Reno replied he had lost his appetite. Kafka then pulled out a Tetra Pak called Supercharged Vitamins and tossed it to Reno, suggesting he take it since not eating would quickly drain his energy before the afternoon. When Reno hesitated, Kafka added that he also needed nose plugs, as it would make their work easier if he had them. As Reno tried to argue he didn't need them, Kafka scolded him, insisting he stop making a fuss and accept that he needed them. Their co-workers, observing their banter, commented that Kafka was always like this at the beginning. In the following scene, they had finished their work for the day and Kafka's co-workers went home. Kafka was glad that they had completed the hardest part of their job. Reno called out to him and turning around, Kafka praised his good work and asked if he was there to make up for Kafka's help. Reno explained that thanks to Kafka, he was able to get through his first day of work, and he appreciated it. Kafka was touched and surprised by the acknowledgement, modestly saying it was nothing. As Reno was leaving, he remembered something and informed Kafka that management had raised the maximum age for new recruits in the defense force to 33, possibly due to the declining birth rate. He knew Kafka's life was his own, but Reno noted Kafka seemed really down when they discussed how he had given up before. Even though Reno said he didn't care, Reno's demeanor showed he did care and wanted Kafka to pursue his dream again. As Reno was leaving, Kafka called out to him, and upon turning around, Kafka thanked him, admitting that Reno was a better person than he initially thought. Just as Reno was about to get angry, a yoju emerged behind him. When Reno turned around and saw it, he was shocked and froze, but fortunately, Kafka was able to rescue him. They fell to the ground, and as Reno was still trying to understand what was happening, the yoju attacked again. But Kafka managed to kick Reno away to save him. 
Kafka yelled at him to run away and send an alert once he was safe. When Reno argued that doing so would leave Kafka alone, Kafka pointed out that nothing would change if they both remained there. After all, Reno was eager to join the division, so dying there would be pointless. Eventually, Reno forced himself to flee from the scene. This left Kafka alone against the giant Yoju, realizing his life was over. The Yoju attacked, and Kafka managed to block it but was overpowered. As he reflected on how things had come to this, we're taken back to a flashback where he was a child with the young Mina Ashiro. They watched Kaiju destroy their city. Young Kafka was irritated because he was close to finishing Yuriman, which puzzled Mina, considering there were far more important things at that moment. Mina, tearful, said she was sad because Miko the Calico had died. They both fell silent and then simultaneously declared their intentions to join the defense force. They were surprised by each other's declarations, with Kafka questioning what a brat like Mina was saying, and Mina retorting that he was just in grade school. Eventually, Kafka said they'd see who would become the cooler officer, vowing to take down all the kaiju together. Back in the present, Kafka struggled to dodge the Yoju's attacks, thinking things shouldn't have ended up this way. Just as the Yoju was about to devour him, unexpectedly, Reno returned and stopped the Yoju from eating Kafka using a sign. Angry, Kafka listened as Reno explained he had already sent an alert to the officers, and when Kafka protested again, Reno added that if he just left Kafka there, he'd never be able to join the division. Kafka remembered the day he was rejected from the defense force, feeling utterly powerless and unchanged. He was frustrated that he couldn't protect anything, his game, his friend, or even the rookie at his job. Just when they thought the Yoju would kill them both, it was shot multiple times, causing huge holes in its body, and then once more, leading to its explosion. Kafka was shocked, hardly believing what they had just experienced. It turned out the 3rd Division Defense Force had arrived, and they were responsible for the Yoja's explosion. Mina looked at Kafka, causing Kafka to be surprised and look back at her. She ordered her division members, Igarashi and Takaraji, to check on the injured, while she and others went to search for any remaining Yoju. The officers immediately assisted Kafka, and it was then he noticed that sirens had been sounding for a while. In the next scene, the two were brought to Yokohama Minami General Hospital. Lying in bed, Kafka couldn't help but think how extraordinary Mina was because the creatures that were nightmares for others, she could easily kill in a matter of seconds. He realized he was not in Mina's league. Suddenly, Reno called out to him, startling Kafka. Reno commented that he would have been dead if Kafka hadn't saved him, calling it really cool. Kafka was surprised, recalling his conversation with Mina about who would become the cooler officer. Reno added that he truly believed Kafka should rejoin the defense force. As Kafka was defensively saying he cared about Kafka, he heard a punch at his side and turned to look. Kafka agreed with him and it turned out he had punched himself, convincing himself that he should not run from the truth and needed to stop that behavior. He thanked Reno, saying he was truly a stand-up guy, while declaring he would now do everything to join the defense force a flying monster suddenly appeared in front of him. The creature said it had found Kafka, as if it had been searching for him for a long time. Just as Kafka was about to warn Reno, the kaiju entered his mouth. Hearing this, Reno quickly checked on him. When Reno removed the cloth, he saw Kafka transforming into a terrifying monster. They looked at each other, and Kafka, seeing his reflection in the window, realized his appearance. The two screamed so loudly it could be heard outside, and Kafka tried to explain to Reno that it was him, so he shouldn't run away. Another hospital patient saw them and immediately called the defense force. Remembering what happened when they called for an alert, they feared what would happen to Kafka when they arrived and decided to flee from the place. In the next scene, we transition to a flashback of Kafka and Mina. They were studying together when Mina expressed how terrifying it was to think about fighting a kaiju, which were a hundred times their size. 
Pafka gave Mina a head pat and assured her not to worry, promising that he would be there with her when the day comes. We return to the present, where Mina is reminiscing about those words while taking a bath. She remembered Kafka and called him a liar. Suddenly, her smartphone rang with an alert about a kaiju appearance, and she immediately declared that her team would be deployed to take it down. Then we shift back to Kafka and Reno, where Kafka still couldn't explain what was happening to him. Reno screamed in fear again, but Kafka tried to convince him that it was indeed him and suggested there might be a trace of his former self if Reno looked at his face, to which Reno replied that there wasn't, and Kafka looked terrifying. They noticed an elderly patient also terrified, so Reno thought Kafka needed to clear up the misunderstanding. Reno suggested Kafka smile at the elderly man, which he did. However, instead of helping, it only made things worse as Kafka appeared even more frightening, causing the elderly man to faint in fear. When Kafka reached out to check on him, he accidentally caused damage to the surroundings. Both Kafka and Reno were shocked and screamed. Kafka was bewildered, questioning if he was truly the one causing the destruction and if he had become a kaiju. Reno then reminded that division officers were on their way, so they needed to leave. Looking down the hallway, they noticed other patients had seen them, and sirens were sounding. Kafka decided they should escape through a window, but when he tried to open it, he accidentally destroyed the entire wall. Kafka was shocked by his actions and wondered what was happening to his body. After that, Kafka and Reno fled the hospital and ran away. The city was informed that a small-scale kaiju had appeared in Yokohama, urging those nearby to evacuate to the nearest shelter and secure their windows for safety. There was even a teenager annoyed by the government's alert tone, wishing it would be changed, and a family decided to turn off the lights in their house. Returning to Reno and Kafka, they were running hastily. Reno made sure that the kaiju with him was indeed Kafka, whose appearance suddenly changed again, sprouting tentacles and weird mini-monsters on his head, while he explained that he was starting to get confused. Reno screamed again and asked what was growing on his body, questioning if it was some kind of special move being activated, to which Kafka responded that he, too, wished to understand what was happening. Suddenly, Kafka's tongue developed a mouth, grabbed a resting bird from the power lines, and pointed it out to Reno, who was disgusted by the sight. Soon after, Kafka returned to his normal monster form, a change that Reno remarked as unsettling even in its reversal to normalcy. Kafka then mentioned they had a significant problem, which, when queried by Reno, he explained was the urgent need to urinate. Reno asked him to try and hold it, but Kafka explained that the body he had acquired seemed to have a mind of its own, making it impossible to control. Kafka was uncomfortable with the situation, lamenting that at his age, urinating in the middle of a public street was humiliating. When Reno inquired about how Kafka would manage without any apparent means, Kafka couldn't hold it any longer and his urine came out through his nipples. Both Kafka and Reno were shocked and stunned by the event. Kafka then stopped and cried, believing that no one would want him as a bride now, so Reno might as well leave him there to die. Reno pulled him along, explaining that he wasn't going to be anyone's bride anyway, and that everything would be alright. Kafka wondered what would become of him now, and if he still had a chance to join the defense force, to which Reno bluntly said no. Reno explained that Kafka would only become a target there, so they wouldn't waste their time on him. Kafka agreed, frustrated that he had become a kaiju at the moment he had decided to pursue Mina to her current location. Thinking about how he could do that in his new body, he realized this meant he could never join the defense force. Reno shouted that they had found a cordoned off area, ensuring it was deserted. Suddenly, Kafka felt something and stopped, prompting Reno to ask what was wrong. Kafka sensed a kaiju about to emerge from underground, and then an explosion occurred behind them. Kafka explained that the creature that appeared was similar to the type they had fought the day before. Reno was surprised by Kafka's detection ability and quickly realized that this would mean the defense force would send fewer forces after them, providing a chance to hide. 
They considered themselves lucky since the evacuation caused by Kafka meant they could only hope that the emerging Yoju Kafka sensed wouldn't harm anyone. However, as they were running, Kafka felt that the emergence of the Yoju had caused harm to a mother and her daughter. The young girl was crying because her mother had been pinned down by furniture and couldn't move. The Yoju was closing in on the child, prompting the mother to urge her to run. The girl refused to leave her mother, embracing her tightly instead. Just as the Yoju was about to consume the child, Kafka arrived in time and punched the Yoju away from the mother and daughter. The girl was shocked to see Kafka propel the monster away. Kafka was surprised at his own strength, but seeing the crying child, he tried to regain his composure and asked if she was okay. However, his appearance only scared her further. He attempted to comfort her with a smile, but this only made the girl cry harder and become more frightened of him. The Yoju managed to stand up again, so Kafka told Reno to take care of the two while he dealt with the monster. When Reno asked what Kafka planned to do, Kafka prepared to attack again, explaining he would hit the monster with all his strength. Feeling the impending power of Kafka's attack, Reno quickly moved the mother and daughter to safety. Kafka counted to three, and upon delivering a solid uppercut to the Yoju, its body exploded. He couldn't believe it as he watched parts of the Yoju scatter around the area. Reno was also astonished by what they had witnessed, with the Yoju's remaining hand landing near them. As the Yoju's blood began to flow, Kafka commented that he was certain he should never use that strength on a human being. Afterward, Kafka decided to take the mother and daughter to the hospital, but noticing the girl was still frightened of him, he slowly approached and calmly explained that Reno would take them to a safe place while he would leave, so she shouldn't worry. Kafka then left, but as he did, the girl called out to him and thanked him. This triggered a flashback of Mina mimicking Kafka's statement that when the day came to eradicate the kaiju, he would be there with her. Mina laughed and told Kafka to stop reading manga, which embarrassed and annoyed him. He warned her not to tell his mother or aunt, fearing they would share it with other mothers in the neighborhood. Mina thanked him, saying it wouldn't be scary as long as they were together in the fight. He remembered the times they had grown and worked together to defeat the kaiju, realizing he needed to act. Reno called him, informing that the officers were approaching so he should leave and Reno would take the mother and daughter to the hospital. Kafka, reverting to his human form, declared he wouldn't give up. He wouldn't surrender because he needed to act if he wanted to be with Mina again. In the following scene, Kafka was reported and introduced to the public as Kaiju Number 8, and he is now being hunted by the defense force. He was called Kaiju Number 8 because he was the eighth documented sighting that year. Kafka's co-workers commented on how long it has been since that kaiju was captured, where one of them suggested it might be dead. In Reno's mind, he was saying that their situation was getting out of hand, and he explained that it had been three months since Kafka became the first unneutralized target since the inception of the defense force. So now, the defense force officials throughout Japan are trying to find him. Suddenly, Reno was called by their officer there and he handed over a letter that was apparently for him and Kafka. He was surprised to learn that Kafka was on site and working the early shift. Upon opening the letter, he saw that they had passed the first stage exam of the defense force. Because of this, he immediately went to where Kafka was to tell him the good news, and upon arriving at the site, he found Kafka eating while in his kaiju form. He kicked Kafka hard and asked why he was exposing himself. Kafka wondered if it wasn't too early for a fight, to which Reno angrily explained that it was his face that was the problem. Soon, Kafka realized he was in his kaiju form and mentioned that when he doesn't notice it, it just comes out on its own. He fixed his face, but it wasn't fully restored, which still irritated Reno. Reno informed him that there was recent news about him, so he should be more careful, to which Kafka agreed. After that, Reno calmed down and handed over the letter to Kafka, who accepted it calmly. Reno was surprised and said he thought Kafka would be happier about it, 
but Kafka arrogantly explained it was because he always failed the second stage. Reno also asked what Kafka's plan was for his body. Was he just going to let it be? Kafka boastfully said not to worry because he was good at hiding it even when his mouth was transformed, causing Reno to be irritated. Reno explained that the second stage wasn't just about reading and writing like the first stage, and there would be many officers involved. So, if those officers see Kafka's situation, they would not hesitate to take him down. Kafka proudly said that despite the situation, he would still take the exam. He had done a lot of research in the past three months, but had not found a way to return to normal. He added that at 32 years old, this exam was his last chance to reach Mina. Reno commented that it was good, but reminded Kafka to remember that he would not give up no matter what, and Kafka would still be his rival. Kafka smiled, and as he was opening his tumbler, he suddenly transformed into his kaiju form because the lid was so tough, which caused Reno to yell out that he retracted his statement and they were bound to fail in their endeavor. Kafka pleaded with him, explaining that it would be okay and he could hide it when it really mattered, but Reno was truly irritated and told Kafka not to expect him to save him if their plan went awry. After that, Reno left the scene irritated while Kafka just watched him. Kafka felt relieved when he learned he had passed the second exam and thought that if this had not happened, he would have been a pathetic excuse for a role model for Mina again. He returned himself to normal and focused on his revenge match. In the following scene, 10 days later, the day of the second stage Defense Force Officer Selection Exam arrived to be held at the Nishitokyo testing site. Soon Kafka and Reno arrived, and Reno's face showed his amazement at the size of the Tachikawa base. He said it was even bigger than the Kumagaya base he had visited on his social studies trip. Kafka explained that the place shared a building with the Japan Self-Defense Force Camp, and in case of emergencies, they worked in conjunction to dispatch officers throughout Nishitokyo. While observing, Kafka noticed the number of officers on watch there, prompting Reno to comment that if Kafka transformed suddenly there, he wouldn't help him. Kafka bravely decided to continue, then someone called out to him as old man. He ignored it and looked for the reception, so the person who called him repeated the call. Reno tapped Kafka, and when they turned around, they saw a woman calling him, exuding a cocky aura and calling him a simpleton. Kafka was bewildered when the woman called him old, and soon after, he got annoyed and pointed out that he wasn't old, just 32 years old, to which the woman simply reiterated that he was indeed old. Kafka couldn't believe it, and even asked Reno if the woman was correct, with Reno saying she wasn't entirely wrong. The woman pointed out their shabby truck, mentioning she needed to park and asked them to move it. Given the ample open space in the parking lot, Kafka was irritated and highlighted this, but the woman explained she wanted to park where they were because her lucky number for the day was five. Kafka was furious about the nonsensical things the woman was saying, so he challenged her, saying he would teach her a lesson in manners. The woman just sighed and began to undress, stating that she would move the car herself. Initially, Kafka thought she was just undressing, but the woman revealed she was wearing armor similar to Mina's. Kafka noticed this and after undressing, the woman effortlessly lifted their car with one hand. Reno was shocked by what he saw, and the woman then threw the car. Kafka panicked because the car thrown by the woman was a company car. While Reno was puzzled about who the woman was, she introduced herself as examinee number 2016, Hikaru Shinomiya, whose hobby was killing kaiju. Reno was surprised to learn the woman was a Shinomiya. Hikaru approached Kafka and questioned if it was just her, or if Kafka smelled like a kaiju. Reno quickly explained that they work for a kaiju disposal company, which is why they were there. As Kikaru inquired about the work of disposal workers, she was startled to hear a noise from her side. Turning around, she saw Kafka fixing the car she had knocked over, which surprised her. She couldn't believe it and thought Kafka also had his own private suit. Kafka then introduced himself to the woman as examinee number 2032, telling Kikaru not to forget him. While Kikaru maintained a poker face, 
Kafka didn't realize that her butler had already switched their parking spot, which impressed him with the butler's efficiency. Kikaru suddenly explained that she had come there as a rite of passage, but expected to have some fun as well, planning to make a fool out of Kafka in their upcoming encounters. Afterwards, Kikaru left with her butler, Sabesu. Reno then stomped his foot loudly, startling Kafka. It turned out Reno was angry because Kafka didn't hesitate to use his powers earlier. Kafka tried to justify that he managed to transform only the parts of his body that were not visible, but Reno pointed out that wasn't the issue. Some officers approached them due to the noise, asking if there was a problem, to which they denied any issues. Reno irritably whispered to Kafka that if he did that again, they would surely be kicked out. In the next scene, a short while later, the second stage examination at the Nishitokyo testing site began. This was known as the toughest exam in human history. In the following scene, Kafka was shown panting heavily, unable to believe what was happening. He couldn't understand why he couldn't keep up with his fellow examinees despite his daily routine of workouts and hard manual labor. Flashback to before the exam started, he and Reno discussed that the second stage of the exam was divided into two parts, a fitness test and an aptitude test. Reno agreed, explaining that the second stage focused on general aptitude, and the examinees were often against the wall because the contents always changed, making it hard to prepare for. Kafka mentioned that since the second part was essentially a wild card, they needed to accumulate points in the fitness test. Returning to the present, Kafka struggled with the fitness test, pondering if this is what they meant by everything going downhill in your 30s. He considered using his powers to possibly catch up with everyone ahead. Soon after, the fitness test results came in, and he placed 219th out of 225. He encountered Kikaru, who sarcastically commented on his speed and called him stupid. Kafka was embarrassed because he remembered his boastful statement to Kikaru, asking her to forget what he said earlier. Reno whispered at him, questioning if he really didn't use his kaiju powers. Kafka responded that everyone there had worked hard to get where they are now, so it would be unfair to use his powers just to get ahead. However, after trying to appear noble, Kafka cried, admitting he just wanted to look cool and wished he had used his powers since it had been so long since his last attempt. Reno thought about it, and said that probably wasn't the reason for his low placement in the exam, which puzzled Kafka. Meanwhile, Mina received information on the examinees from a subordinate, who noted many interesting candidates this time. As the man doubted Mina's interest in anything non-kaiju related, she saw Kafka's paper and told him to continue, surprising him because it was rare. He started pointing out noteworthy candidates, including Haruchi Izumo, the valedictorian graduate from Tokyo Neutralization University and the number one prospect of the year. There was also Iharu Furuhashi, the powerhouse valedictorian from Hakyoji Neutralization Technical College. And not to forget the rising young star of the ground SDF, Aoi Kagaraji, who declined a guaranteed future in the JGSDF to apply for a transfer to the Defense Force. He noted these were just half of the bunch, as there were various tracksuits from different neutralization universities and colleges nationwide. He also mentioned these candidates were highly qualified, more suited for executive roles than field positions, calling them elites. Kafka realized that this was why he couldn't keep up with them. Reno added that the best among them was a woman. All candidates were looking at this woman because she was admitted to California Neutralization University at 16 and was their youngest valedictorian graduate. This woman, praised as the greatest talent of all time, was Kikaru Shinomiya. The top examinees had various reactions while observing Kikaru. Kikaru boasted to Kafka that he had seen how good she was, to which Kafka abruptly exclaimed that she had been a big shot all this time while holding her shoulders. Kikaru was surprised, then Kafka was beaten by Kikaru's butler and bodyguard because of him touching her. Haruchi and Ahara wondered who Kafka was. This was the second time Kikaru made Kafka look foolish, making her wonder how long he would tolerate it. Kafka was irritated with Kikaru, 
and it was announced that the second part of the exam was about to begin. Kafka shouted at Kikaru that soon. She would be the one looking foolish. After that, the trainees were assembled in Area 2. Kafka quickly lost his confidence, admitting he could barely keep up and yet he was boasting. Reno cheered him up, saying there was still hope, because in the past two years, the second part of the exam had been about kaiju body disposal. It seemed the organization wanted to raise awareness about other aspects of kaiju neutralization beyond just killing them. That was the reason why he had decided to work part-time as a dismantler. Kafka felt encouraged and said that in that case, they would put everything on the line in the next part. Upon reaching the next area, Kafka was amazed by the size of the training area. They were then greeted by the head of the screening exam selection committee, the third division vice captain, Hashina. He opened the door to area two of the exam, and while Kafka expected their task to be dismantling a kaiju, he was wrong. Their goal was to neutralize the kaiju in front of them. Kikaru smiled at this development, while Reno and Kafka were utterly shocked. Kafka broke down to Reno, questioning where the promised kaiju dismantling task was, to which Reno responded not to blame him since he only mentioned what the examinees had done in the past two years. Hashina informed them that they wouldn't be sent into the field unarmed, hence they would be provided with body suits. Upon wearing the bodysuit, Reno was surprised as it seemed to merge with his body, taking his body measurements and performing form assimilation. It was also operational with kaiju muscle fibers, measuring his unleashed combat power. He felt his physical strength multiplying, realizing this was what wearing a defense force suit felt like. He was informed that his unleashed combat power was at 8%, leading him to ask Hashina what that meant. Hashina explained it indicates how much power of the suit you're able to release, making Reno realize he could only unleash 8% of the power. Hashina cheered him up by saying a trained general officer could only unleash 20% of their power, which Reno found hard to believe. When Kikaru's power was measured, she had an unleashed combat power of 46%, making Hashina think she's at the level of a platoon leader, while others remarked it might be a new record for a pre-enlisted. Haruchi, Aoi, and Aharu unleashed combat powers of 18, 15, and 14%, respectively. A doctor mentioned it was already impressive to have a candidate reach 10%, but was astonished at the current results, prompting Hashina to comment it might be their luckiest year. Reno felt quietened by the high unleashed combat powers of his peers, but Hashina reassured him that as long as his number was above zero, he was likely to pass. While explaining he had never seen an output of 0%, Kafka's measurement sounded, shockingly revealing a 0% unleashed combat power. Hashina couldn't believe what he saw, and the doctor speculated it might be a measurement error. Kafka tried to increase it, asking for a bit more time, causing Hashina to laugh at his appearance, as if he was straining. Hashina laughed so hard he cried, which irritated his colleague, who wished he would take the exam more seriously. Kafka became angry at himself, thinking there must be a trick to increase it, which he needed to figure out before the second section of the exam ended. Kikaru internally expressed her irritation with Kafka, wishing he would show the power he displayed in the parking lot. After all examinees donned their battle suits, Hashina commenced the final test. The examinees headed out to the field, beginning the second round final test of the defense force screening exam. Hashina explained that their target was 36 Hanju and Yoju positioned throughout the expansive training area designed to resemble an urban district. He added that these kaiju had claimed 16 lives in Hakiyoji last year and were captured alive to serve as training for the next generation of recruits. Each participant was assigned an auto-tracking drone to monitor them. If their life was assessed to be in danger, the team controlling the exam would activate the participant's suit shield. However, he emphasized that activating the shield would mean failure in the exam. He also stated that there's no guarantee of survival from this exam, but if they were prepared to proceed regardless, they should go out and fight. Other examinees charged ahead, and when Kikoru encountered a Yoju, she quickly eliminated it. 
Kafka then declared they should also advance, reminding Reno to stay close to him. Kafka struggled to carry his equipment, prompting Reno to remark that he should be the one saying that. Kafka proudly explained that without the suit's support, the equipment was extremely heavy, a fact only known by those in tune with Zero, which annoyed Reno who told him not to make it sound cool. Reno then asked what their plan was given their lack of offensive abilities compared to others. Hashina remembered that Captain Mina would also be proctoring the exam and reminded the examinees to show their best. This announcement caught Kafka's attention, and he calmed himself. He seriously explained to Reno that it was odd for the proctors to assign drones to watch everyone. Reno agreed, noting that if the test was based on the number of kaiju killed, they could simply count them using sensors. Kafka agreed, saying they were being assessed on how they act and adapt to what's required. Therefore, given their weak offensive abilities, their best course of action was to provide backup. Reno informed Kafka of an enemy engagement to their right, and Kafka instructed him to circle around to provide cover. When Kafka saw the Yoju, he recognized it as similar to one they handled in a joint disposal with the Ida cleaners in Hakioji. He realized that they were given such equipment specifically for dealing with these types of yoju. He grabbed a grenade and immediately threw it at the yoju, causing a bright explosion. The effect was powerful against the yoju, surprising Reno. Kafka explained that these creatures have a hyperdeveloped sense of hearing to compensate for their rudimentary eyes so damaging their hearing makes them easier to defeat. Kafka informed the battling Haruchi and his companion that the Yoju's skin was thinner on its stomach than other parts, suggesting they target it. Hoichi promptly acted on the advice and thanked Kafka for the assist, but Kafka was irritated because he was called a Shinomiya groupie. Hashina noticed Kafka's assist and Reno was pleased that they were able to help. Kafka agreed, explaining that they had dissected many kaiju bodies and were familiar with their weaknesses inside and out, guts and all. Kafka thought he could do this without using his kaiju power, seeing it as a chance to start over and prove himself. While Reno said he would throw the next grenade to provide support, suddenly a yoju emerged beside them and swiftly captured Kafka. Blood spilled from Kafka's mouth as Reno looked on with concern. Kafka was sent flying due to the Kaija's attack, leaving Reno in shock. The proctors immediately noticed this and saw that Yoju-23 was attacking again, prompting Hashina to prepare the remote shield. As he struggled to breathe, Kafka realized the shield was about to be used on him. Remembering the consequence and knowing Mina was watching, he pushed himself to stand because he didn't want to appear even more pathetic in front of her. As the Yoju charged at him again, the doctor activated the remote shield, and Hashina thought Kafka would be the first to be eliminated, commenting it was a pity since he found Kafka amusing but it seemed inevitable. Suddenly, the Yoju's face exploded, halting Hashina, and Kafka saw that Kikaru had saved him, remarking that this was the third time she had made him look foolish. She declared that no one could die or drop out on her battlefield. Before Kafka could thank her, Kikaru bragged and said she was off again to make a dramatic finish to the test, leaving Kafka lying on the ground filled with shame. Kafka was speechless, and Kikaru rushed back into battle. Haruchi, Iharu, and Aoi noticed she was heading towards the main kaiju, trying to beat her to it. Ihara was surprised when he didn't notice a yoju behind him, and after Kikaru killed it, she reminded him to always be aware of his surroundings. Irritated by the force of Kikaru's shots, Ihara wondered if they were really using the same gear. Aoi then realized their unleashed combat power affected the force of their attacks. While lying on the ground, Hashina called Kafka, informing him that his vitals were abnormal, possibly facing multiple fractures and internal damage. When Hashina was about to recommend Kafka drop out of the exam, Kafka stood up, insisting on continuing. He acknowledged how pathetic it sounded to chase his dreams at his age, but told himself he would give himself another chance to try for the defense force, and now he wasn't going to give up on that. Mina listened as Kafka showed them he could still stand, despite his struggles. 
Hashina allowed him to continue but informed him that if his situation worsened, the shield would activate immediately. When Kafka told Reno that they had promised if something happened to him, Reno wasn't obliged to help. Reno reached out his hand, saying he would support Kafka and they should do what they could. Kafka remembered the first time Reno didn't leave him, thinking that must just be his nature. Soon, Kafka agreed to accept Reno's help. Hashina laughed at them and questioned if they were serious. Revealing his amusement came from Kafka riding on Reno to move around. Reno was embarrassed because they were drawing attention, but Kafka pushed them forward, declaring Reno would be their movement while he would attack using his knowledge of kaiju. Hashina joked they could be passed to the comedy department, prompting Mina to tell him to take the exam seriously. Kafka instructed Reno not to worry about his injuries and to catch up to Kikaru, because if they didn't, she would finish the exam on her own. Reno agreed and reminded Kafka not to fall off, then suddenly sped up. Kafka thought they were moving too fast. As they discussed providing cover, once they caught up to Kikoru, she was quickly eliminating the remaining Yoju with her remarkable strength and speed. The exam seemed like a walk in the park for her, and the other top examinees couldn't believe they couldn't match her skill. Despite their efforts to catch up to Kikoru, they couldn't provide cover fire for her. The doctor announced that Kikaru had defeated the last Yoju and was advancing towards the remaining Hanju. Kikaru grabbed a stun grenade and threw it at the monster's face, disrupting its sense of sound. She jumped to get a good angle to shoot inside the Hanju, and soon, Kikaru bombarded the Hanju's throat with numerous attacks. The other examinees could only watch Kikaru's skill and speed, while Hashina and Mina continued to judge them. The Hanju finally fell, and the doctor informed the others that the monster was defeated. She announced to the examinees that the final test was over. While still riding on Reno, Kafka was extremely irritated with Kikaru for literally taking her statement to finish the exam quickly too seriously. Other examinees lay exhausted as the control team recalled the drones. The doctor asked Hashina if their protocol was to recall the drones and attend to the injured, to which Hashina agreed, somewhat disappointed by the swift conclusion of the exam despite extensive preparations. Mina then commented that what she had heard about Kikaru exceeded her knowledge, indicating Kikaru's exceptional performance. Hashina thought his captain was genuinely interested and remarked that they had anticipated at least 30 dropouts. However, no one dropped out, and there were only minimal injuries, attributing this to Kikaru's direct presence. It turned out Kikaru was the daughter of their commander, Commander Shinomiya, and Hashina stated there was no doubt that Kikaru would be the linchpin of the defense force in the future, the light of hope the country needed. Kikaru reflected on her training when she told her father she had executed the test perfectly. Thinking she needed to go back to make Kafka look foolish again, she suddenly noticed something behind her. It appeared to be a unique type of kaiju, standing as if humanoid. Kikaru was startled, wondering what it was, noting there was no information about it on the neutralization list. The creature pointed, and unexpectedly, Kikaru was struck in the chest, resulting in a hole there. Reno and Kafka lay exhausted, with Reno commenting that the rumors about Kikaru Shinomiya being a monster were indeed true, to which Kafka agreed and eventually retracted his initial skepticism. However, it was thanks to that woman that he had given it his all until the end, and now all they needed to do was wait for the results. As Reno agreed, he suddenly noticed something, and upon looking to the side, he was shocked to see that the kaiju, which Kikaru had knocked down, were regenerating. Kafka couldn't believe what he was seeing, while Kikaru was vomiting blood due to the injuries she had sustained. She explained that by focusing her shield on a single point, she managed to block the kaiju's earlier attack from reaching her heart, and she believed she could still fight. He was surprised to see a giant kaiju following the human-like kaiju. Her eyes widened as she heard the latter speak, explaining to the giant that it will leave the rest to it. The human-like kaiju pointed out Kikaru again, instructing the giant to chew its food well before swallowing. Kikaru suffered another unique attack, striking various parts of her limbs. 
Hikaru could no longer move while the kaiju drooled over her. Hashina detected that Kikaru's vitals were dropping, and they were puzzled because the monsters that had died on the exercise ground began to revive one by one. Hashino thought that those monsters shouldn't have such an ability. Before long, they confirmed that the resilience of the revived base monsters was at 6.4, which surprised Hashina. He commented to himself that the strength of the monsters was increasing and that they would need an entire squadron to defeat monsters of such a high level. While pondering who he knew could defeat such a kaiju alone, he was promptly called by Mina, who instructed him to head to the location as well. He pointed out that the only people he knew who could do that were either Mina or himself. Hashina activated all the examinee's shields and also sent drones to monitor their situation. The drones sounded an alarm about an emergency outbreak at the location, and all the examinees were required to evacuate to the nearest shelter. Reno yelled at Kafka to move, while others, in fear, abandoned Kikaru in front of the giant kaiju. Kikaru was irritated by the evacuation order, stating that someone needed to bring down that monster or many people would die. She managed to suppress the bleeding from her suit's monster muscles and struggled to move to fight again. She had a brief flashback of her father's words, saying that for the future of their country, she needed to be perfect. She managed to stand up and shouted that she needed to be perfect. However, unfortunately, she did not notice the Kaija's attack and was struck by it, sending her flying against the wall. The force of the impact shattered the concrete where she landed. While Kikaru thought she would not be defeated, we move to a flashback of hers, showing that since the beginning of middle school, she had always been the top student, admired by her peers. Kikaru proudly told her classmate that she was the head of the class. Suddenly, her classmate's father gave her child a pat on the head. As they bonded and he mentioned buying a toy, Kikaru just stared at them. Before long, the father and daughter, along with other classmates, left, and Kikaru found herself just looking at the proud parents with their children. Kikaru felt sadness as she was surrounded by families who were very proud of their children. Her butler, Sabesu, arrived to pick her up, informing her that her father was coming and would surely be pleased with Kikaru's exam results. She happily anticipated this. However, instead of praise and love from her father, Kikaru only heard his serious utterances. He told her that she had to be the top student, downplaying the struggle it took to get there. He warned that if she dwelled on one's success, someone would pull her down, so she needed to strive immediately for her next goal. Her father added that for the future of their country, Kikaru had to be perfect, also for the sake of her dead mother, to which Kikaru lifelessly agreed. Returning to the present, spurred on by her father's words, Kikaru continued to push herself because she believed she could not afford to lose or give up. Even though she was battered, she still thought she could fight, reflecting on her father's words not to let anyone equal her, to become an overpowering being in existence. As Kikaru thought that as long as one of her hands could move, she could continue to fight, she suddenly realized that the bone in her right hand was also broken, which immediately made her lose hope. The giant kaiju suddenly grew horns, and the control room noticed that the vitals of the base monster had changed, and the combative uni organ they had removed had regenerated. When it began to gather energy using those horns, Hashina thought it was bad and that the attack could still reach them. Kneeling and unable to do anything, Kikaru apologized to her father because she couldn't remain perfect. The base monster then released its accumulated energy ball attack, and Kikaru closed her eyes, asking for forgiveness. Suddenly, Kafka appeared in front of her and complimented her on her excellent exam performance. Kikaru was puzzled about why he was there, and soon, the monsters attack at them solidly. When Kikaru thought it was the end for them, Kafka managed to save her and remarked that thanks to her hard work, everyone present was able to evacuate. It turned out that Kafka had revealed his kaiju transformation to Kikaru and told her that he would take care of things from there. Kafka confronted the giant kaiju to protect the injured Kikaru. Before Kafka arrived there, we saw that Aharu, 
Perucci and Aoi helped other examinees reach a safe place. On the other hand, the three examinees with Kikaru earlier met Kafka and Reno as they were leaving Kikaru behind. When Reno asked if anyone was left behind, they heard that Kikaru had been severely injured while holding off the base monster. Just as Reno was about to ask Kafka what they should do next, he turned around to a shocking discovery that Kafka was no longer behind him. He wondered if Kafka had decided to transform, initially thinking Kafka wouldn't do it, but realizing that in their current situation, if Kafka did transform, it would likely result in his death. But he also realized that Kafka wouldn't hesitate if it meant saving someone. Returning to Kafka and Kikaru, she was utterly shocked to see Kafka's transformed body and wondered if there was a connection to the human-like monster from before. Kafka seriously called out her name, but soon after, he knelt before her, pleading with Kikaru to keep what she saw a secret from the defense force, to which Kikaru was surprised. The monster prepared to release another energy ball, which worried Kikaru. However, Kafka easily deflected the attack with just one hand. The monster's attack was diverted, and while Kikaru looked on, Kafka said he would explain later, but first he needed to launch the monster before them. Kafka prepared to charge, telling Kikaru she could relax and rest for now. The people in the control room were informed of another mysterious burst of energy near the base monster, leading them to believe a new monster had emerged there. As Hashina and Mina charged forward, Hashina asked the control room what they were seeing. The doctor explained that the explosion had created a cloud of debris causing network malfunctions, making it hard to see the situation. However, the doctor suddenly noticed something unbelievable. The readings showed a resilience of 9.8. Hashina questioned the veracity of this, suggesting that the machine might be damaged and causing erroneous readings. But if it were true, Hashina noted that the being could be recorded in history as one of the strongest monsters to ever exist. We returned to Kafka, as the monster he was facing charged at him. As he prepared to attack, small limbs emerged from Kafka's feet and dug into the ground to stabilize his footing. Kafka tightened his grip on the ground to strengthen his attack. He apologized to the monster, stating they had no time left, and he would end the fight with just one punch. Kafka clenched his body to the ground so hard that the surface beneath him was destroyed. As he was about to punch, his elbow opened up, and something resembling a rocket booster emerged from it. The punches from Kafka and the giant kaiju coincided, creating a powerful shockwave around them. The entire arm of the giant monster was destroyed, leaving only bone, until the force of Kafka's attack reached its body, and soon after, the giant kaiju completely disintegrated. Kikaru could hardly believe what she was witnessing. After his attack, Kafka boasted that if the monster could resurrect, then it should try to survive after his attack. The monster's innards began to move, which frightened Kafka, prompting him to retract his earlier statements. However, the monster's remains quickly collapsed, and Kafka felt relieved, commenting that it shouldn't scare him like that. Kikaru just stared at him in disbelief, unable to grasp that he had defeated what she had not been able to even in perfect condition. Just when she thought Kafka was about to attack her, it turned out that an after-beast had appeared at their side, and that was Kafka's actual target. Kafka then remarked that the situation seemed under control, and he was glad that Kikaru was safe. Kafka returned to normal as Kikaru watched him, and he reminded her that she needed to take better care of herself. Reno arrived and immediately gave Kafka a noogie out of frustration. Kafka was surprised and asked what he was doing there, to which Reno explained that since Kafka had a habit of disappearing, he was sure Kafka had revealed his transformation to Kikaru. Kafka explained that at first, he thought he could partially transform, but upon seeing the kaiju, he realized it was impossible to hold back. While Reno cautioned him to be even more careful, Kikaru, who was injured, lost consciousness. Reno and Kafka became worried, and shortly afterward, Mina and Hashina arrived, informing the control room of their presence. 
Hashina and Mina were surveying the area, and Hashina wondered what could have happened there. No matter the cause, he thought, the death was not natural. They were approached by two officers, who explained that they could no longer find any examinees in the area. The control room contacted them, and Mina inquired about the report. The doctor explained that three examinees had just arrived at shelter number six, and it seemed that they were accompanied by Kokoro. Hashina felt relieved upon hearing that it seemed Kokoro was still alive. The doctor reported that all the examinees had reached safety, which Mina and the others understood and mentioned to continue treating them. Hashina questioned what they thought really happened in that situation because, despite Kikora's strength, he found it hard to believe that she was the sole cause of all the conflict there. There was also an issue regarding the revival of monsters in the area, leaving many aspects of the incident unclear to them. An investigation was deemed necessary. Mina instructed the officers to make arrangements for an investigation and disposal team while Hashina was to handle any remaining monsters. As Hashina looked around, he thought the incident resembled the scene left by an unknown subjugator three months ago, coinciding with the appearance of monster number eight, leading him to ponder if there was a connection between the two incidents. Elsewhere, in the first aid room, Reno and Kafka were talking. Reno commented on how lucky Kafka was to have sustained lighter injuries than expected, whereas Kafka was displeased about being in the hospital again. Reno mentioned that Kikaru seemed to be in stable condition and was being cared for by the Defense Force's top medical team. This upset Kafka, who questioned why only Kikaru received such treatment, expressing his desire for similar care. Reno explained that Kafka only suffered from fractured bones, prompting Kafka to simply lie down and reflect on how quickly events had unfolded. It had been a long time since he had competed against such formidable individuals, reminding him of certain truths. Pursuing one's dreams means constantly being defeated by someone every second of every minute. However, he also recognized that there was an overflowing passion that allowed one to forget all about it. This was what he remembered. Reno caught Kafka's gaze, and Kafka added that it was all thanks to Reno's encouragement for which he expressed his gratitude. While they were conversing, Mina was shown just outside their door, listening in. Shortly after, Mina entered their room, causing everyone to look in her direction. Kafka was taken aback upon seeing Mina and asked why she was there. Mina had found out that the two of them had carried the severely injured Kikoru, so she saluted and thanked them for helping to save a life. This surprised both of them. After that, Mina left the room, and as Kafka was about to call out to her, he decided not to proceed and thought it best not to speak with her just yet. He resolved to talk to her after becoming a troop member, a goal he was determined to achieve in the future. In the next scene, we move to Kokobunji City in Tokyo, where an unexpected incident was reported at the Defense Force Examination venue. The monsters there had suddenly regenerated, and although many were injured, there were no fatalities. It turns out that a human-like kaiju was listening to this news on a smartphone while in the restroom, having exited from the exam. It wondered why none of the examinees had died. Disbelieving that after all it had done there were still no deaths, it speculated whether the commander was really strong enough to have thwarted its actions. Suddenly, its cell phone rang, and it attempted to answer, using its knowledge of gadgets. Upon pressing the phone, the caller seemed to be looking for it, indicating that their break time was over. It was mentioned that they needed to dispose of at least one kaiju on the train tracks by the time the first train started running, at which the human-like kaiju transformed and said it was on its way back. Slowly transforming into a human, it asked the others to wait as it hurried back. After the call ended, the monster commented on how irritating humans were. Having completed its transformation, it exited the restroom and apologized to its colleagues, claiming it had a stomachache. It was revealed that this monster worked for Monster Sweeper Inc., and we saw Toku and other co-workers of Kafka, who reprimanded it for not informing them when it left. On their way to the site, others commented on hearing about an accident at the test venue. Toku wondered if Kafka and Reno were alright. 
while the human-like monster behind them seemed to still be struggling with its transformation. After the unexpected incidents, fortunately, Kafka was able to complete the final exam. Reno thought that after overcoming all obstacles, Kafka seemed to have become more reliable. Suddenly, Kafka shouted, saying he couldn't do it and was extremely afraid, which immediately changed Reno's impression. On the day the exam results were published, Kafka blamed Reno for his encouragement, attributing his severe anxiety to it. Reno became angry and reminded Kafka that he had thanked him while they were in the hospital, questioning what had happened to the man who had given him such praise. Someone knocked on their door, and a man arrived with a letter for both of them. The nervousness was evident on their faces. They took the letter, and Kafka suggested they open it together on the count of three. As they looked at their exam results, Kafka thought whether the outcome was happy or sad. It was the gamble that would determine whether he could be with Mina again. He counted to three, and upon seeing his exam result, the scene shifted to another where the enlistment certificate was being presented to the examinees. Hikaru was named the top examinee, proudly accepting the honor. Mina explained to all the examinees that from that day forward, all 27 who took the exam were appointed as Defense Force Troop members. Hikaru commented that on behalf of the new members, she promised to fight with her life. Mina told her that she had greatly contributed to the incident at the examination because, thanks to her, there were no casualties, which surprised Kikaru. Kikaru thought she wasn't the one who defeated the monsters there, and that Kafka deserved those words. She looked at the other examinees and wondered why she couldn't see Kafka among them. She was irritated because, of all the people there, Kafka was the only one who came to help her and even had the audacity to worry about her, which she found embarrassing. She also needed to ask about his monster form, so she wouldn't forgive him if he just disappeared. Then the door at the side opened, and it turned out to be Kafka, apologizing for being late. Hikaru was visibly pleased to see him, and Mina, Reno, and the other examinees also looked on. Before that ceremony, we return to the meeting of the higher-ups regarding the examinee's results, and it turns out Kafka had failed. One of them said there was nothing they could do because Kafka scored the lowest in the physical test, and his compatibility with the suit was zero. When the man asked if anyone would object to his decision, and as Mina was about to say no, Hashina raised his hand and explained that if that was the case, he would take Kafka under his wing. He explained that Kafka's scores were indeed below average, and he failed to become a troop member. However, during the final exam, Kafka exhibited something special while fighting. Moreover, he added that above all, Kafka's performance as a comedy section personnel was exceptional, which irritated the doctor, who remarked that she knew that was Hashina's reason. Hashina wasn't sure if Kafka could be promoted to a formal troop member, but he planned to train him as a cadet in his platoon. Returning to the ceremony, Mina explained that she had Kafka absent from the troop member appointment ceremony because he would be joining them as a cadet. Kikaru was delighted, while Haruchi, Iharu, and Aoi couldn't believe Kafka had made it in. Mina and Kafka exchanged glances, with a sense of their shared past palpable between them. Now that all the members were present, Commander Mina Ashiro was about to give motivational words. Mina stood up and explained that the number of monster outbreaks and resilience had significantly increased compared to last year's averages, and there was also a mysterious case where dead monsters were being revived. She assured them that life-threatening, dangerous battles would continue, and some might die on their first mission. She requested the new troops to give their strength, promising to lead them and be their sword and shield in battle. While listening, Kafka suddenly called her by her name, shouting that he would soon be by her side again. Mina stared at him, while the other troops were utterly shocked. They were bewildered because Kafka casually called their commander by her name. Mina took a deep breath, and soon after, she had Kafka do 100 push-ups for speaking without permission and disrespecting a superior. After that, Mina left. Hashina laughed remarking that Kafka had made them laugh from the start, and he questioned Mina if the punishment wasn't too light. As Mina walked away, she seemed to laugh, 
which puzzled him. The doctor commented that Hashina's comedy section had already started making them laugh, with which he agreed. Hashina explained that their job was very tough, so he believed they needed someone like Kafka. He also thought that was only half the reason he took Kafka in. He was sure that the reading last time of a Resilience 9.8 monster appearing while other monsters were alive was just a malfunction, but the vitals of a particular examinee disappeared at the exact same time that happened. And the owner of those vitals was Kafka. Including the abnormally low compatibility with the suit, there seemed to be something off with Kafka, so he intended to keep Kafka by his side and get to the bottom of these occurrences. In the next scene, two months after enlistment, the new recruits continued their training. Reno was practicing his shooting, internalizing the use of his intuition. He managed to hit all the moving targets and completed his shooting training in 2 minutes and 35 seconds. His new estimated released force was 18%, which amazed the other troops. Hashina was pleased with Reno's rapid growth, calling it somewhat astounding. Ihara was irritated by Reno's fast improvement, but managed to complete his training in 2 minutes and 15 seconds, with an estimated released force of 20%. He immediately bragged to Reno, claiming victory and telling Reno not to boast, to which Reno responded that he wasn't boasting. While they were talking, they were drawn to Kikaru's result, she finished her training in 1 minute and 16 seconds, with an estimated released force of 55%. She bragged to them, saying that even if they combined their scores, they wouldn't reach hers. Haruchi exclaimed, sheesh, and commented that the more he sharpens his skills, the more he feels slapped by his own mediocrity. Aoi asked him if he should be looking at others instead. Aoi revealed that she had matched his force, showing that she completed her training in 1 minute and 59 seconds, with an estimated released force of 25%. Haruchi scratched his head, feeling he was the weakest among the three, including Aoi. He seriously stated he was sure he could outdo it when it was his turn to train. A slight rivalry heated up between the two, felt by Aharu and Reno, while Kikaru remained as proud of herself as always. Suddenly, Kafka shouted from the side, grabbing their attention. He completed his training in 6 minutes and 39 seconds. His estimated released force was 1%, and Kafka was delighted with that result. He turned to Kikaru and bragged to her. He asked if Kikaru saw that he turned a 0 into a 1 and demanded praise, leaving Kikaru shocked at his arrogance despite her 55%. Hashina called Kafka aside and explained that at this rate, he wouldn't be able to become an official member and would be fired in three months, surprising Kafka. The Hark found Kafka strange while Reno just smiled. Next, Hashina had the troops run 15 laps around the perimeter and told them that they were done after that. The doctor commented that the newbies were indeed competing in strength, to which Hashina agreed and explained that even without his supervision, it seemed they were competing against each other to strengthen themselves. In the following scene, the newbies finished their training and took a shower. Kafka, exhausted, called Hashina the devil for making them run laps at the end. Kafka noticed to horror, bragging to Reno about needing more muscles. He watched the two argue about muscles, and Reno told Iharu that he wasn't far behind him in muscles and fitness. Haruchi commented that Reno was competitive too, to which Kafka irritably agreed. Suddenly, Kafka shouted, telling them not to argue over such trivial matters and to be quiet after they see the muscles of an adult who has experienced manual labor. Iharu was initially amazed, but then pointed out that Kafka's large stomach didn't fit the defense force's image. Iharu laughed while Reno tried to hold back his laughter, commenting that Iharu was rude. Kafka, irritated by them, retorted that they'd better make sure they're prepared by the time they turn 28. Annoyed, Kafka challenged them to arm wrestling. Soon after, Aoi arrived, asking what was happening because of their lively discussion. Upon seeing Aoi, Iharu and Reno were speechless due to his large physique. Iharu, Reno, and Kafka then ducked down, and Aoi asked what the problem was. Iharu called themselves Bean Sprout Boys, 
and remarked that Aoi's physique was expected of a former self-defense force official. Kafka thought it had been a long time since he had experienced something like that. After a while, they were all in the bath, and Aharu asked why they decided to join the defense force, explaining that he joined because of Mina. Since being saved by her when he was in middle school, he had admired her. When he asked Haruchi and Aoi, they said they had family reasons but essentially, their goal was Mina. Kafka whispered to Reno about Mina's significant influence, to which Reno replied that she was their generation's superhero. When Aharu asked Kafka, they were surprised to learn Kafka was Mina's childhood friend. The Hark seemed irritated that they had a promise to become troop members together. When Kafka decided to leave, the three quickly stopped him, irritably asking for details about their past. Kafka explained to them that when Mina was born, the weather was beautiful, she liked dried squids since she was a child, and in elementary school, Mina was the caretaker of the animals there. Meanwhile, Kikaru and another woman exited the women's bath and saw the men sprawled on the floor, prompting Kikaru to poke her face and ask if there had been a serial murder or something, to which another woman explained that they had a deep conversation and overheated in the bath. Apparently, they were discussing Mina, which Kikaru understood, commenting that men are really stupid. In the next scene, Reno, Aharu, Haruchi, and Aoi were asleep, while Kafka was still studying. Because of what Hashina told him about being removed in three months at this rate, Kafka decided to work harder than anyone else. Suddenly, someone commented from his side that he had a good spirit. Turning, Kafka saw it was Hashina, who added that sleeping was also part of the job. Kafka scratched his head but quickly became serious, stating he couldn't be removed from there. Hashina asked if Kafka's efforts were for their commander, Mina, to which Kafka blushed and asked how he knew. So Hashina explained they discussed it in the bathroom earlier. Hashina Kripalis suggested, considering that anything discussed in the dorm could be heard by him. Afterward, Kafka said he made a promise to fight alongside Mina. Hashina suggested it seemed Kafka aimed to take his spot as vice commander, which Kafka initially denied. But then, retracting his denial, proudly stated he would do everything with that intention. This irritated Hashina, who banged the table and said to go ahead and try, scaring Kafka. Hashina gave Kafka two hours to study, handed him the key to the place, and reminded him to lock up everything when he was done. He seriously stated he wouldn't give up the position next to Mina. Kafka's hopes rose, and just as he was about to thank Hashina, Hashina advised him that being friendly with fellow troop members should be done in moderation because it's not unusual in their job for something to happen to anyone at any time. Suddenly, their alert went off, and Reno also woke up when it was announced there was a monster outbreak, and the troop members were to prepare for an immediate attack. While they were just discussing such events, it suddenly occurred. Hashina took Kafka with him, saying it would be his first mission.